In today's episode, we're going to be pointing our telescope at our friendly neighborhood star, the Sun. But as advised by literally every single telescope company on the entire planet, you should not be pointing your telescope at the Sun unless you have the appropriate protection. And depending on the protection you use, the Sun can look very different. For example, when using this smart telescope and a white light filter, the Sun looks like this. But if we use some more specialized gear, i.e. a hydrogen alpha filter, we start to notice a lot more detail on the surface of our Sun. It's possible to capture images like this even as a backyard amateur on a budget. My favorite choice of telescope that fits this criteria is the Coronado PST, with this particular model costing me $600 to purchase second hand. I made a video at the start of the year comparing the views of the Sun through different solar imaging setups in which the Coronado telescope was the most powerful of the three options. I want to see close-ups of sunspots and solar eruptions in jaw-dropping detail. And obviously, we are not going to be observing the sun from here in the UK because, let's face it, the weather, as always, is crap. So instead, I'm going to be using a remote observatory located in sunny Siding Springs, Australia. It's supposed to be summer. For this episode, I've been fortunate enough to work with Eye Telescope, leaders in internet astronomy since 2006, and one of their most recent developments is the release of an outrageously powerful solar telescope that anyone can rent for their own personal usage. In today's episode, I've got the chance to spend some exclusive time on the telescope so that I can produce one of the most detailed images of the sun possible here on Earth. I'll also be focusing on particular regions of the sun throughout the day to produce a time lapse showcasing how volatile and active the sun's surface is. This kind of stuff is literally happening right now, 24 seven. So let's get started. I'm Damon Scotting, and this is Astronomical. As I'm sure many of you may already be aware of by now, the sun is on the fritz. It's reached the peak of its 11 year cycle, which means it's currently at its most active point since 2013. How does this affect us here on Earth? Well, it means we end up seeing things like this as far south as Texas. So if there was ever a time to start imaging the surface of the sun, it's now. But before I start controlling the solar scope, here's a little bit of background information on the incredible setup I will be utilizing for this episode's entry into the Astronomy Photographer of the Year competition. It is located at an observatory in Siding Springs, Australia, beneath some of the best skies on the planet. Being located 1,165 meters above sea level also helps ensure the Earth's atmosphere is calmer and therefore ensures that the telescope can take high resolution images of the sun on a consistent basis. The telescope is an Explore Scientific FCD 100 series 127 mm carbon fiber APO. Ugh, that's a mouthful. It takes images with the help of the ZWO ASI 432 monochrome camera. Combine this with a highly specialized Daystar filter and you have all of the necessary requirements and conditions to take some of the clearest images of our sun possible. It's very difficult to get much better than this, and if it was, they certainly wouldn't let us amateurs use it. You can book a 45 minute slot in which one of the remote observatory staff will share their screens with you, giving you a live feed of the telescope and what the telescope sees. You're in charge, you can focus on anything you want. Maybe a particularly active region of the sun is taking your fancy. And if it does, you can choose to create a time lapse of it, or my personal favorite, you can automate a complete mosaic image of the sun, capturing roughly 22 individual videos, which can later be constructed into a complete image. Now that is unbelievably cool, and it's exactly what I'm going to do today. Now let's rip the roof of this bad boy and start imaging our friendly neighborhood death machine, the sun. The chaps in charge here have very kindly granted me as much time as I need to familiarize myself with this telescope. With it being located in Australia, this means that I will be remotely controlling it from my home in the UK. Once we can see the telescope is okay and no kangaroos have snuck in overnight, seriously, that's not a joke, we can then connect to the telescope and mount before then slewing towards the sun. The software we are using then gives us a polite reminder to say, hey, idiot, are you sure you wanna look at the sun? To which we then dismiss this gleefully as we have already taken the necessary precautions to safely observe the sun. The telescope then slews towards the sun, still no kangaroos, that's good, and then all of a sudden we reach the sun. Now it's extremely likely that if you are using the solar telescope, it will already be completely set up for your usage. So these steps are purely academic. They will not eat up into your observing time should you wish to use it. I just wanted to give you a true behind the scenes look on what a cool experience this is and the level of effort that goes into assuring the maximum precision in capturing your images. You're probably wondering why is the image gray? I thought our sun was supposed to be yellowy orange. You can make the sun whatever color you wish. The camera captures it in monochrome, that is to say black and white. Monochrome cameras are capable of higher detail and sensitivity than color cameras. We can super easily add an appeasing color for the sun in later, but right now we are valuing the quality of the image over the desire to have it show up as a familiar orange color. 
Right, so now I'm going to have a look around the surface of the sun and basically see what's what. If you want another way to do this before you jump onto the telescope, you can head to this website here to see what the sun is currently looking like from one of these major solar observatories. And at the time of editing this video, it is looking extremely chaotic. Like generally, we look for an active region on the sun, but at the moment it's harder to find an inactive region. We'll then take this video containing 5,000 frames that was captured in just over a minute and then swiftly stack it to give us our resultant image. Now I'm going to do a quick and dirty edit with this image using one of our previously created image profiles. And there we go. Now of course the look of the final image itself is solely up to your own discretion. You can alter it in any way you see fit. Everyone has their own preference. But this whole imaging and processing process has only taken a couple of minutes you've booked in for at least 45 minutes. So what else can we do with all this time? Well, you could continue imaging this same active region and as a result, produce a series of images that when played back in a sequence will beautifully showcase a time-lapse of the sun. And if you do choose to do so, you can create some truly mind-blowing videos of the sun. I've watched some of these at least a hundred times now. They are mesmerizing. Or your alternative is to create a high resolution mosaic image. And this is exactly what I'm going to enter into the astronomy photographer of the year competition. So what do I need to do in order to take a full picture of the sun? After all, the telescope's field of view is highly magnified. In the olden days of astrophotography, when capturing my moon mosaics, I would take images of overlapping regions of the moon and then stitch them all together in an auto-stitch software before then editing the final image. This took a lot of time and an extreme level of focus and patience. It's happened before and it sucks. When you finish imaging the entire surface, you've taken at least 20 different videos or images, and now that you've stacked them and stitched them together, you've missed a spot devastating. And it's not like you can just pop back outside and quickly image the region you missed, because even in a short period of time the illumination of the moon has changed drastically and now that particular region is lit differently to how it was before. However, now with the help of imaging software such as SharpCap, I open the sequencer tab, click on the solar mosaic planner, calibrate the sun's position relative to the camera's point of view, set my margin for error, and go. Fully automated, it has the information it needs, it knows what to do all regions completely covered, simple and straightforward. Now, since the surface of the sun varies from day to day, it's going to have good days and bad days, which is why for my joint submission to the R Sun category of this competition, I'm going to use my colleague Duncan's image. And although he'll be too modest to admit it, his rendition is spectacular. This 34 megapixel image allows you to explore the entirety of the sun's surface and its atmosphere. For the use of this rentable solar scope from iTelescope, you could commit to multiple back-to-back -back imaging slots and even go as far as creating mosaic time lapses of the sun. Now, wouldn't that be something special? And if you'd like to take some images for yourself, then you can find the link to their website below, as well as the link to the main iTelescope website that gives amateurs access to a vast variety of telescopes located all across the globe, with a few select telescopes being free for users to use. No credit card required. And on that note, I have captured a hidden treasure of our night sky by using iTelescope services. This is the James Webb Telescope's image of the truly spellbinding Cartwheel Galaxy. The galaxy was once a typical spiral galaxy before it was hit by a head-on bullseye collision with a smaller galaxy about 200 to 300 million years ago. This collision caused a powerful gravitational shock wave to ripple through the galaxy. We can still see the effects of these gargantuan ripples throughout. The really cool part is that this high-speed shock wave led to compressed gas and dust as it expanded outward triggering a starburst around the untouched central region, an area with a significant increase in star formation. This phenomenon explains the bluish ring around the galaxy's brighter center. As we see the galaxy today, it's starting to look like a traditional spiral galaxy once again. Yeah, it's, it's possibly my favorite image of a galaxy, perhaps largely due to the fact it appears so small to us here on our planet, meaning we don't get many amateur views of the galaxy at all, which is a huge shame. But I used one of our telescope's most powerful telescopes in an effort to capture the Cartwheel Galaxy, and this is what I mustered up. Even with the colossal power of this remote telescope, the Cartwheel Galaxy still only inhibits such a small region of our field of view but it's enough for us to get a decent look. Fortunately, we have views of the galaxy captured with multiple space telescopes that have revealed its secrets. Otherwise, I can definitely see this majestic galaxy being mistook for a planetary nebula. Is it the highest quality image of a galaxy you've ever seen? No, but it is unique. It's an exceptionally difficult target to image that I highly suspect has never been entered into the competition before. So hopefully this year, I'll be bringing something new to the game. 
The Our Sun category is a very difficult category to be shortlisted for. The level of quality in images from other amateurs is staggering. It will be interesting to see how this image fares against the others in this year's competition. One of the most widely observed solar eclipses of the century happened shortly after the deadline for this year's competition closed, so this category is only going to get more difficult the following year. With that being said though, what an image. I'd tossed and turned with the idea of submitting one of the images I'd captured, but when Duncan posted his in the group chat, I was blown away. So this entry is very much a team entry from which my only real significant contribution will be that I filled out the submission form and swiftly came to the rightful conclusion that the sun on this day was looking particularly spectacular. Next time on Astronomical, I go from seeking help to capture an image to seeking inspiration. As I point a big and powerful telescope located in Chile at coordinates to correspond to the name of one of the most important role models in my life, Sir David Attenborough. The region his name has corresponded to was incredible, so special in fact that I felt obliged to send him a framed copy of the image for his 98th birthday present. Tune in next week to see what that image looks like and more. I'm Damon Scotting and this was Astronomical.